And uh, if I remember correctly, uh, for today, group three uh, will be presenting to uh, everyone else. Um, so group three uh, get, uh, gets ready. And uh, right, we can start now. Thank you. Thanks, Shinshi. Okay, so uh, today's about biomechanics and robotics. And um, I wanted to start really simple about what is biomechanics and what do you think it means and how do you think it's relevant to robotics? So if people could unmute or put in the chat what they think biomechanics means and how they think it's relevant to robotics or them or anything like that, that would be good. I'd like to get a little bit of a discussion going. Uh, please don't let me sit here in silence with no one talking back to me. For me, biomechanics uh, is like um, pretty much like medical, but instead of like people trying to like, you know, operate, you have like machines pretty much helping the person's day-to-day -day life pretty much. Okay. I mean, you, you're like instead of like uh, having a person help, you know, like, yeah, machines. Okay, cool. Someone said looking at the movement of biological organisms, awesome. Can we get a third one to round it all off? Mm -hmm. um, looks like we're not gonna get a third one, but that's okay. Thanks guys for kind of chiming in. Oh, it's the science behind natural movement. I like it, okay. Um, so, Sorry, two screens. So biomechanics is the study of mechanics in a biological system. And that could include biofluid mechanics, which is the study of gas or liquid in a biological system. So this would be how your uh, blood flows. So for example, the cardiovascular system. Uh, the cardiovascular system is actually a really, really complicated mechanical system. It's a, um, it's a pump system. So the blood in your body gets pushed through at a non-constant pressure, which is really different to how the majority of um, mechanically designed uh, system, uh, fluid, fluidic pumps are, are built. You can also look at synovial fluid in the knees and uh, other joints, and it also includes respiration. So you can study uh, human or animal respiration and uh, gas exchange to improve the design of uh, filters or um, robotic uh, respirators for people who can't breathe, uh, like those in iron lungs. There's also cellular biomechanics, which is the mechanics of cells and cellular structures. So uh, all cells move, and it's a study of how they move and uh, what mechanisms they use to do that. Also, there are structural supports within the cells. Uh, all of your cells stay in that shape somehow, and that's uh, these structural supports. So um, that's biomechanics. Movement biomechanics is the one that most of you were sort of alluding to, which is uh, the mechanics of movement in a biological system. So you could look at human walking, um, but you could also do canine running. And something of interest to quite a lot of people is uh, cheetah tails. So when a cheetah or other big cats run, their tail is actually a really important part of how they move. It balances them. It helps them turn corners really quickly. So this is uh, all part of movement biomechanics. Uh, an interesting field, which some people consider uh, biomechanics is motor control. So that's how the neural signals uh, control movement and how those pathways are done. So for example, uh, there is in cats, a pathway that allows uh, the legs to do a walking motion that doesn't even involve the brain. So they've done experiments where they cut the spinal cord and the cat put the cat on a treadmill and the cat's back legs will uh, relearn how to walk using just the neural signals from the legs uh, 
back up to where the spine is broken, which is morbid, but interesting. Uh, the final field I'm gonna talk about is muscle biomechanics, uh, which is the mechanics of muscles. So uh, there's different muscle fiber types and all of those muscle fiber types have characteristics. So how quickly they can be recruited, how long they can hold strength for. And there's a really interesting relationship in muscles between force, uh, length, and velocity, which is non-linear um, and really useful uh, for, for humans and other animals. Uh, there's also the study of ligament and tendons and how those tear and how those can be um, healed uh, with uh, movement and uh, other such things. Okay, so that's um, some of the general fields of biomechanics. What we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how biomechanics is relevant to robotics, because I believe you're all uh, roboticists or aspiring roboticists. So the main one uh, on what I will focus on most today is wearable or human-centered robotics. So that's things like metal arms or, um, exoskeletons or a device that is a robot that a human can wear or use uh, to do anything really, not just to improve uh, function, but to do anything. So this is um, a spoon that is designed for people with Parkinson's. So people with Parkinson's have tremors and trying to eat independently is really hard. People can design this little robot it's not wearable, but it's human centered and it balances um, the tremors so as the person can eat independently. There's also bio inspired robotics. So there are things like this salamander robot where they studied how a salamander moves. They did a lot of time and effort and motion capture and investigation into how a salamander moved and somewhat actually part of its uh, control. And then they built that as a robot and it's a really successful robot. Um, probably everyone has seen or heard of Boston Dynamics. Uh, this is also a bio-inspired robot. So it is a robot that moves sort of like a human. And I don't really think dancing dogs are supernatural, but Boston Dynamics also has uh, dog-inspired robots. And this is just an example. There are tons of robots out there that are inspired by biological uh, systems like dung beetles or um, ants. It's a really big and interesting field. So uh, we can also use it uh, to investigate biomechanics or robotics. You use a robot to ask questions and understand biomechanics or you use biomechanics to try and understand how we could improve our robotic system. So what I'm showing now is a pneumatic artificial muscle or a McKibben actuator. So it is a linear actuator that uses air pressure uh, to contract or relax. And it's a little bit like a human skeletal muscle. Uh, it's also, you can use exoskeletons or other devices and to understand how biomechanics work or to improve um, biomechanics and improve your robotic design. Okay, so talking about whole body and muscle biomechanics. Am I talking too fast? Can everybody understand me? That's good, thank you. Okay. Um, so how do we measure animal movement? And that's in a system called motion capture. I'm pretty much just gonna focus on human because um, I've only worked with humans, but it's pretty much the exact same uh, process for uh, bigger animals. So horses, dogs, cats, anything like that is the same. And uh, there's a slightly different technique for smaller animals like rats or mice, because they're just a little bit more difficult to put markers on. So has everybody seen this sort of motion capture for movies or games or animations where they put these little dots on? 
and then they track the facial expressions or the whole body expressions and then put that into a CGI character. So that's kind of what I think a lot of people have seen or are aware of. Um, but what we do is we use those markers over the full body to get data of interest. So, sorry, that isn't looped. Um, so we can look at the, the joint angles and the joint forces and the joint moments, which are some of uh, the more important metrics used in uh, biomechanics. So this is uh, an example optical motion capture system. Uh, there are infrared cameras spaced throughout the room, all pointed at the area in the middle, which is called the capture space. So this is the area at which you're interested in looking at data. And then there are these reflective markers placed on points of interest. They look like this. They are literally just a circle, or a, sorry, a sphere wrapped in reflective tape. That's all that happens. And these are positioned uh, on important parts of the body, uh, like outside uh, of the knee joints, the catch of the knee, uh, at the ankles and at the foot. And these uh, markers are used to track the person's motion. So what happens is you have a person walk through or in your capture space, your camera sends out infrared light. So it shoots out uh, infrared light at a constant frequency, usually 100 or 200 Hertz. Then when you have a reflective marker, it bounces that infrared light back at the camera and the camera records that that light. So here's a um, picture from our lab. And we have seven of these cameras placed around the room. And you can see the markers on the important parts of the body. So on the front of the pelvis, the top of the femur, which is the thigh bone, and on the knees, on uh, the ankles and on the foot. So when we take this picture in the system, it builds this. So this is all of the cameras and all of the cameras are taking a 2D image of markers that they can see from the light reflected back. So I've zoomed in on each of these cameras um, so you can kind of see how that 2D image looks for each of them. And then it is, uh, built into a 3D render. So all of those uh, spheres, the size is exactly known. I think they're 14 millimeter in diameter. And uh, the cameras in 2D are all matched up in 3D and it builds you that model. So in uh, real time, it looks like this. So you have all of the cameras seeing those individual markers and then that builds your 3D image of the person walking. So this could be used for dogs and any, any type of movement. People use this to study sports biomechanics, which is how you can improve your, um, like how well you bat in baseball or tennis or um, people will use it to study martial arts or anything. It's a really, really, really useful tool. Um, okay. So in addition to using motion capture, one of the most common tools is force plates. And that's these sort of purple squares. These are a sensor that you put on the ground and it measures force in three planes. So you get vertical force, uh, medial lateral force, medial meaning inside, lateral meaning outside. So that's the left to right force. And then also your anterior posterior force. So your forward backwards force. It also measures uh, center of pressure. So where on the uh, force plate is all of the center of the pressure from one foot. And um, it can measure moments as well. So the moment uh, of the foot connecting with the force plate. So when you have uh, your kinematic measures and your force measures, what you can do is you can do uh, inverse dynamics. Are people familiar with inverse dynamics from a robotics standpoint out of interest? So 
inverse dynamics is when we know our forces and we know our accelerations in a rigid linked system, but we don't know our moments. So we start from uh, the bottom of the system, which in this case is the loop, and you know the force. Um, the force is this blue arrow. So this is our force vector. And uh, we know the force. We've used the markers to track the, the position of the segment. And we use that to find acceleration and angle. And then with the force combined, uh, we can use that to calculate the moment uh, at the ankle. Once you have the moment at the ankle, you can work up the system and you find the moment at the knee and then the moment at the hip. So in this uh, plot with time on the x-axis, and here this is ankle angle. So this is uh, ankle flexion and ankle extension. This is the vertical force of the force plate. And then you combine them along with acceleration uh, moment, uh, sorry, uh, the inertial properties of the segment as uh, some geometry, some lots of good data. And you can combine that to get the, uh, the moment at the ankle, which you can then use uh, to calculate the knee moment, so on and so forth. Uh, some, uh, another really important signal in biomechanics is muscle activity. So if you don't know much about muscles, that's fine, because I'm going to start at the beginning. Uh, when a muscle is relaxed, it is at its long, at its natural resting length. So it's, it's not doing anything, it's just chilling out. You can then contract that muscle. And contracting a muscle will often uh, cause a joint to move. So if you can, this is your gastrocnemius muscle here. Uh, when you contract that muscle, what happens is you pull uh, the shank segment towards the thigh segment. So you flex your knee and also it attaches to the heel of the foot. So it also plantar flexes the foot. So the ankle is uh, extended. You can also have uh, isometric contraction so you can tent, like if you were to all just sit in your chairs right now, really tense your legs without moving, that would also be a contraction. When your muscle is relaxed, there's very little electrical activity, but there is electrical activity. When you contract, you get large amounts of electrical activity. So uh, for a muscle to contract, it generates or requires electrical activity, which we can measure with sensors. This is called electromyography. There are a few different types of EMG. Uh, surface EMG is the most common. And it sort of looks like this. You have um, typically a bipolar setup. So uh, the EMG signal is measured between two uh, poles. So it's measuring the voltage here, the voltage here, and then it is uh, finding the value between them to measure that signal. You can also get monopolar, uh, but this is, I think, the most common type of EMG used. You get intramuscular EMG, where essentially a really, really small wire that is sharp is inserted into your muscle. So it's um, positioned inside the muscle. And you get a completely different signal then, because the electrical signal that you read for surface EMG, um, that electrical signal that comes from, is the electrical signal that you're reading is neuronal. And uh, when you're outside of the, the body, that electrical signal is diffused through, uh, all of the muscle is diffused through the fat, it's diffused through the skin, and you get a very different signal to if you stick an electrode directly inside the muscle, because there's, there's nothing uh, really altering with the signal there. Uh, the most uh, recent type of electrode is high density. 
And a high density electrode is uh, similar to a surface electrode, but instead of having two poles and the voltage read between them, it's like 100, uh, 200, uh, really uh, ele 200 electrodes that are really close together and are evenly spliced throughout the body. So the reason for that is that one electrode on an entire muscle can't actually capture how the muscle is uh, working. So if you think of a muscle as just one actuator, as one simple uh, system, then it, it would make sense to just have one sensor per muscle. But that's not how muscles work. Uh, muscles are made up of fascicles and fibers, and all of these fibers can contract individually. And what you'll find is that the fibers in one area of the muscle might actually have more activation than fibers elsewhere in the muscle. And what these electrodes are really good at showing is how that activation is spaced out across the muscle. And they're also good at showing fatigue. So at the start of an activity, you might find that there's a lot more activation in this area of the muscle. But as the person fatigues or becomes tired, actually this area of the muscle um, becomes more active. So when you take uh, your raw EMG muscle, a uh, raw EMG data that's shown sort of in blue, it's uh, a lot of high frequency and um, it's positive and negative values. So for processing the data into a signal that is um, easy to understand or uh, useful for a multitude of reasons, uh, you filter and rectify it. So it's a low pass filter and then rectify it, that's in purple. Um, and then if you want to compare EMG across different people or different days, you need to normalize it because what might be a 0.2 microvolts for me on a different day could be um, on the same muscle, same position, different day could be a 0.1 because your signals uh, will change based on a a whole host of reasons. So you want to normalize your data. And in this case, I'm normalizing to the maximum activation. And then uh, your signal is never going to be above one and it's never going to be below zero. And that makes uh, a signal that's easy to compare across days, across people, across conditions. Okay. Muscles are comparable to linear actuators. And what I want to ask is how many muscles do you need to have full control of knee flexion and extension? So that's this. I've just drawn that one muscle as an example, but how many muscles does everyone in this room think that you need to control this movement? So bending your knee. Seven, okay. Two, mm -hmm. Okay, we'll run with those numbers. So you would think two is reasonable, right? If you were designing a robot and you were doing this with linear actuators, you could probably do it with what? But in the human body, these muscles here, these are muscles which control knee flexion. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's a seventh in there somewhere. Here it is, this little one down here. So that's seven muscles just to control knee flexion. Knee extension has an additional four muscles. So these ones are on the, uh, the front of the thigh. That's one, two, three, and then there's a fourth one uh, underneath, which you can't see. So that's 11 muscles to flex and extend the knee. That is way more than a system needs. And there's a reason for that. One of them is evolution. The muscles 
might have been part of one muscle, the muscles might have had lots of different functions. And as we evolved, we just didn't need them uh, to do different activities. So now we have multiple muscles that do the same function. So the, the human body, and in fact, most animal bodies are over actuated, which means you have more actuators than you need to fully describe the system, which makes things complicated for understanding. Because why have three muscles active when you only need one? And that is a really interesting part of biomechanics for me. <laughs> one muscle can do more than one function. So the function of the muscle really depends on the attachment points of the muscle. So this is the gluteus medius. Um, this is one of your butt muscles. And it attaches to the pelvis up here and to the femur uh, here. So when this contracts, it moves the hip in this direction, which is abduction, but it also causes internal rotation. So the thigh is rotated about its vertical axis. So that's two functions caused by one muscle. And that's not uncommon. A lot of muscles will do some sort of flexion and extension and internal or external rotation or abduction and adduction. Uh, it gets a little more complicated because instead of one muscle uh, activating one joint, some muscles activate, actually activate two joints. I'm talking about the legs a lot, by the way, because I know the leg muscle. It gets even more complicated when you get into the hands and arms. So the muscles which can actually two joints are called biarticular muscles. The rectus femoris is a biarticular muscle that causes hip flexion. So that brings your thigh closer to your uh, torso and knee extension, which locks your knee. And you can tell that because, oops, can't pause that. It connects up at the pelvis it passes all of the femur, and then it connects again on the, on the shank. So when that contracts, it's pulling this bone up, but it's also locking this bone with respect to that bone. Okay, so I am gonna ask some more questions again. Um, how would you define robotic prosthesis robotic exoskeletons, and in general, wearable robots? And what do you think wearable robots should be used for, could be used for, or will be used for in common, uh, commonly in the future? Uh, you can answer any of those questions. You can unmute yourself, you can type them, but I want to hear your opinions. And again, there's no wrong answers with this. I've had very um, lively debates with colleagues about what the definition of an exoskeleton actually is. So no wrong answers, no judgment. I just wanna hear what you guys think. I can't even blame the silence on my internet connection because it's good for once. A skeleton worn on the outside of the body to aid with movement. I'm guessing we're talking about exoskeletons there. That makes sense. Exo means outside. Um, skeleton is a skeleton. Okay. I would be more, I think, um, Would you call a device that you wear on the outside a skeleton? Or would you call it something else? Oh, a prosthesis is worn on one limb. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in? Please.
a robotic prosthesis is a replacement of a limb that has a mechanical function. Very nicely worded. I think prostheses can replace a person's missing limbs completely in the future, providing a more realistic look. Good. Uh, something that's really important to a lot of people who use prosthetic devices is that it doesn't draw attention to them. They want something that looks like a normal uh, hand or foot or anything. They don't want to draw attention to um, their physical condition. So prostheses, in uh, my definition, are or robotic prostheses, are devices that replace a part of the body that has been lost. So if you use an arm, then uh, a prosthetic arm would completely replace the part of your body that you no longer have. If you lose an eye and you have a, uh, a sensor, like a, a robot eye that can send signals to your brain, that would be a prosthesis because it is replacing uh, a part of your body and a function that your body was able to do. An exoskeleton is a robotic device that fits over the body. Um, it's in series, in parallel, it's in parallel with your body. Uh, some older definitions of exoskeletons say that the robot must touch the ground. There must be a contact point between the robot and the ground. And that's no longer uh, one of the more commonly accepted uh, terms. An exoskeleton is just a device over the body and it can assist your movement. It can make uh, moving things easier, uh, but it can also make things harder. So one exoskeleton uh, from the Institute of Human and Machine Cognition in Florida, it uh, basically helps you squat. It's like instead of a squat rack where you carry weights, you wear it on your legs and it makes it much harder to squat. And the purpose of this, I think, was originally designed to be used by astronauts because an astronaut in space, you don't have gravity, makes it really hard to maintain muscle mass. So if you use this device and you just strap it on, it provides resistance and allows you to, uh, to, to exercise. Someone said wearable robots should be used for those that are missing limbs or require assistance so they can go about their daily lives. And that's a really uh, altruistic good aim for these devices. It allows people to live the way that they should be able to uh, based on sort of what society thinks humans should do. Uh, so if every person who had a difficulty walking had an exoskeleton that could navigate stairs, then we wouldn't need um, access ramps everywhere, right? Because everybody would be able to walk or take the stairs. The challenge is it's really hard to make exoskeletons or devices that can go upstairs. And then there's people who maybe broke their leg uh, and are in a wheelchair whilst they recover but they don't need a device to fix that um, during the term. So we'll always need disabled access ramps. Uh, a wearable robot definition is a robot that you wear on your person. Um, it, I've had some people tell me that, oh, uh, a mobile phone is a wearable robot because you put it in your pocket and it does things. I don't necessarily agree with that, but um, a robot that you don't have to hold or use a part of your body um, to activate it, but it is part of you. Um, and I agree, wearable robots should definitely be used to improve daily lives, but it can also be used in not necessarily daily lives, but in um, uh, not for people who need assistance, but in warehouses where people are lifting huge weights if they use um, like a back exoskeleton to support their back, they could prevent injury. Uh, they could help them work for longer and it could help people who are, we're, we're moving into an aging society where a lot of people in the workforce are getting older. Uh, it could help people who are older continue working for longer. Oops. Okay, uh, so some examples. 
Uh, this is the exobionic. This is an exoskeleton, which has a traditional force, uh, has a traditional um, foot plate at the bottom. And this is used to help people with like incomplete spinal cord injury or other pretty severe um, mobility challenges. And it allows them to walk independently, although they require the use of crutches. And if you take away the crutches, uh, the whole system will fall down because the person can't balance themselves and the robot can't balance them either. Uh, this is Cyberdyne. So Cyberdyne have uh, a lower limb exoskeleton, an elbow exoskeleton, and also a hip exoskeleton. And these are again designed for people who um, need assistance uh, to reach a level of function that we would consider um, normal. Lockheed Martin has an exoskeleton called the Fortis, which is designed to help um, people who work in factories or who are building ships and carry these really, really heavy tools all day. Uh, robotic, robotic prosthetics can be used to uh, allow a person who has lost a, a leg or um, to walk or run. Uh, robot, uh, prosthetic arms can uh, be used to give someone who only who has not got an arm to interact with their environment. Um, arm exoskeletons can also be used for rehabilitation. So if you use an exoskeleton, it can help you, it can help give you support that you need to relearn how to move your fingers or how to walk. So these are more rehabilitation devices as opposed to an assistive device. So a prosthetic, is going to be assistive, whereas an exoskeleton could be rehabilitative or assistive. And this is uh, the knee exoskeleton that our lab is um, currently evaluating. So this can be used to uh, help people carry loads. So like uh, soldiers or paramedics, or it could be used to help people who have pain at the knee. So those are sort of some of the ones that I talked about and what I saw in the chat. But what about this? This is a wearable robot, right? Like, I mean, you literally got it on a backpack. That is a wearable robot. And this is a camera. And somebody in a different location is controlling that robot. It's still a wearable robot, right? It's interesting, though. Uh, this is something that was designed by someone as, I think, part of their master's degree. It's an extra thumb. It measures EMG signals, and when it thinks you want to contract the thumb, it contracts it. So you could hold a pencil or, um, I don't know what else that could realistically hold, but you could hold things with that thumb whilst your other thumb is free to move. Everybody could use one of them. Would it, but would it take off, would it not? So wearable robots don't just take what humans have and improve on it or replicate it, but they can change it, do something different. And that's, um, I think, a really interesting field. Okay, so we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion time. Um, and then when we come back from the discussion, we'll have a quick discussion and then we'll move on to group three's presentation, if that's okay with everyone. I don't know why I'm expecting an answer, you're very quiet. But I'm gonna put you into, um, breakout rooms, and I want you to all have a, a discussion without me hovering over your shoulder about uh, these questions. So what signals do you think could be used as inputs for wearable robot control? And what are the benefits and weaknesses of some of those control types? Uh, do you think it is easy, reasonable, or difficult to design a good controller for a wearable robot? Uh, when you're talking about this question, think about the purpose, uh, and the role of the robot and the environment that it's going to be in. Uh, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges in designing a successful wearable robot? And what are important factors to consider when designing a wearable robot? And would you feel comfortable using a wearable robot in public? Um, so those are quite a few questions. Maybe you wanna take a screenshot or something um, whilst we're all in the same room. And uh, Jim, she in a second will send you into breakout rooms to discuss this. And when we come back, um, I'd like to hear some people's opinions or thoughts uh, as part of their group. And then we'll move on. Is that okay? Great. 
Uh, so Jinchi, if you could put everyone into the breakout rooms. Uh, yes. Do you want to pause the recording during this point, Jinji? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, yes. Are people still in the rooms? Yeah. Uh, three more. The okay. The room will be closing in 15 seconds. So there are awesome. Three. Yep. That's, that's good. Uh, people who are in the room, um, if you want to type up any comments or conclusions that your group came to in the chat, you could start doing that. Um, cause we're already... Okay, so everyone, everyone is here? Yes, yes. So talk to me. What did people think um, about, ideally let's go through the questions in order, but anything, Let, let's hear what you guys have to say. We can control the robots using the electricity in our muscles, yeah. Definitely, that is a, a method that is used. Um, did you think of any uh, pros or cons about that method? There's no need for an external controller. Okay. Ah, reading the electricity can't be accurate and it may be difficult to detect and interpret those signals. Very well thought out, yeah. I said that um, earlier when the, uh, the electrode is moved or the person fatigues or tires, the, uh, the signal can change. So it's, it's difficult to get a reliable signal. Uh, the most important in factors when designing a wearable robot is comfort, absolutely. And also make sure the design complements our natural movement. Otherwise we open up room for injury. Yes, absolutely. Um, I have worked with uh, exoskeletons in their like really early development stages. And there is nothing like putting on a robot that feels 40 pounds like really heavy and all of the weight is on one like your hip bone it is not fun i would never want to use that in um in daily life uh what about whether it's how, how difficult it would be to design a good controller um 
easy, challenging? What do you guys think? I keep saying guys. I use guys as a non-gendered term. <laughs> Sorry. But what do you people think? Depends on the robot. Yeah, depends on the robot and depends on the function of the robot. Okay. Um, oops, that popped up. Okay, so I'm going to move on to kind of uh, some points that I wrote down for that. Uh, just cheating because I know my answers. So one of the most commonly used uh, control signals for wearable robots is kinematic. So that's your joint angle, maybe even uh, the acceleration and uh, kinetics, that's force or moments. So for this, um, you need sensors. So you can use IMUs on the person, you could use angle sen um, rotational sensors on the robot, you could use uh, torque or load cells in the robot to measure these signals and use that as, a, um, as your controller. One of the really common ways of doing uh, control is actually ground reaction force, but rather than measure, ground reaction force is the force between your foot and the ground. But rather than measuring the exact force, what they measure is whether the foot is in contact with the ground or not, and that can be used as part of a control signal. The trouble with these signals is even though they're easy to acquire and pretty robust, they lag. So by the time your controller has recorded the signal, processed the signal, and uh, calculated the appropriate assistance to provide or the appropriate action to take, the human or animal is no longer in that position. They've moved past it. So the controller needs to accommodate for this lag and predict the most appropriate way of helping, which is difficult if you're not in a steady state. Um, so someone mentioned uh, muscle signals, so that we call neural uh, signals or neural control. Um, it doesn't actually go into the brain and it doesn't go into the neurons, but it, uh, it's muscle activity because it is part of your neural pathways. It's the end of your pathway. Uh, so here, for example, is someone just doing a simple contraction relaxation using um, two electrodes spaced pretty far apart and that can control uh, the robotic arm. One of the really good things about muscle activity is it precedes muscle contraction. So there's, when you read the electrical signal, it takes a little bit of time for the muscle to uh, physically contract. Now the lag is somewhere around 30 milliseconds. So if you read that signal, you process it and you can, um, provide the appropriate action within that time frame. the controller isn't lagging behind the person. They're working in sync. Uh, but as we mentioned, the biggest challenge, or one of the biggest challenges to this, is that your EMG signals are not very robust. Different placements of the electrode will change the signal values. If you don't shave the area, it will affect the values. If you don't clean it, if you sweat, that will change the values. And when you fatigue, the way your muscles uh, activate, that changes completely. Um, so it, it's really difficult to design a controller that works across different days and across different people. Also people with um, amputations or people who don't have um, four uh, complete limbs, their uh, activation profiles in the muscles which um, have been dissected are completely different between person one to person two to person five. It's hugely different. So de designing a controller that it works for everybody is, is a huge ask. And that's why um, a lot of these controllers are still in development and are, are specific to one person. Um, about kind of how difficult it is to do a controller. I'm speaking really generally. Uh, building a controller for one activity it's kind of straightforward. So if you're walking in a straight line at a constant speed and you want to have a controller for a prosthetic leg or an exoskeleton, that's not too difficult. Or if you are picking up a cup from the table and it's in a fixed position and you're bringing it to the mouth and the mouth isn't moving, again, that's pretty simple. 
But if you're trying to be able to build a controller that can handle perturbations, so instead of just walking in a straight line at a constant speed, you're going to speed up and slow down and maybe even stop. How does a controller handle that? A little more difficult. If you are, instead of trying to pick up a stationary object, you're trying to catch a moving object, that's a little more complicated. And now if we're trying to get into actual robust real world controllers, it's a really, really big challenge. So how do you design a controller for a prosthetic ankle that can handle walking over varied terrain? So you're gonna walk up steps, you're gonna walk back down steps, you're gonna walk over a hill, uh, you're gonna stand on a pebble, like a big pebble. Um, and you're going to not walk in a straight line, but you're actually gonna turn corners or you're gonna step out of somebody's way or be able to move quickly or um, sidestep. And all of this at different speeds. That's a really complex controller because you either need um, activity classifications or uh, you need a system that knows exactly what the person intends to do and can accurately predict and uh, respond to that in a reasonable time frame. So another example would be you're catching different objects. So they're different shapes, they're different sizes, they're different textures. Um, some of them might break and they're thrown from different places and they're thrown at different speeds and the person is moving. So let's say this is a robotic uh, prosthetic arm that you're building. How does the robotic arm compensate for how the person themselves is moving and in which direction. So these are like, when you start, when you think about controllers for wearable robots, the big challenge in my opinion is being able to understand the intention of the human and how the human interacts with that robot. Because if you tell the human, we're gonna do one simple action, easy to build a robot. If the human is doing whatever, the, whatever they want, whenever they want, much harder to build a robot for that. Uh, so some of the design challenges, biggest one is weight. Um, if you are wearing a robot, you need to carry the weight of that robot. Every mass, every kilogram of mass that is added to the body increases the energy you need to move. So it's a, di it's a direct relationship. And um, <laughs> not only is there a direct relationship, but the position of the mass changes the energy required. So if you add mass at the uh, the torso uh, or the back, um, those have the least penalty. Whereas if you add weight to the fingers or the, the, the ankle, that has a pretty high penalty. And if the robot doesn't compensate for the added penalty uh, that it brings, then it's not going to help. It's just going to make walking or moving your arm even more difficult. Also, when you change the weight distribution, you change how you move. So all of our bodies are built in a certain way and we know how the weight moves and how the inertial properties are affected. If you change the inertial properties of a segment, that can change how you move and wear muscle patterns and it can change everything about how the movement is controlled. Another big issue is actuator power. Uh, muscles are really surprisingly strong. They're really, really good actuators. Um, the, uh, they're lightweight, they're pretty fast, and they're powerful. Uh, a wearable robot needs to be able to provide a similar or reasonable level of torque or force or assistance, whatever you want to call it, to be helpful. If it doesn't, then you're just adding mass and not really assisting. So you need powerful actuators, which are usually heavy. And if it's heavy, then you need more power to compensate for the heaviness. Uh, control, we talked about already. And in a real world environment, you need a robust controller. And it's all very well saying this exoskeleton works great, in a, um, in a treadmill at a certain speed without stopping. But that's not applicable to the real world. Um, and a lot of the robots that um, are currently like FDA approved 
are very often for people with uh, severe um, physical limitations, uh, spe specifically for walking. Because if you are completely dependent on your prosthetic limb or your exoskeleton to support your balance, and that exoskeleton or that prosthetic fails, you're probably going to fall and you might hurt yourself. So how do you make sure that the system is really robust? And that's one of the biggest challenges um, to real world implementation. So outside of the lab. Uh, considerations when designing for humans. Safety, just mentioned that. If the device fails, you need to make sure that the risk to the user is minimized. Function and redundancy. Does the device actually do a good function? Because if you have a really fancy robot that says it can do everything, like uh, let's say you have a prosthetic arm and you can use it to do everything you want, but to use it, you have to use a phone app and you use the phone app, this is common, you use the phone app to say what grip you want the hand to have and uh, then you activate it yourself, but you use the phone app to change the grip. Is that more or less helpful than just having a mechanical gripper that's got no robots, it's just a, an old fashioned prosthetic where uh, you rotate the shoulder and it contracts the hand. Because if your awesome robot is more complicated or more difficult to use, why would the person want the robot instead of the cheaper, um, easier to use option? Uh, something which uh, I think is becoming more popular when we're talking about wearable robots is embodiment. And embodiment is the feeling that the wearable robot is part of you, it's part of your body. It is an extension of yourself. So when you use a pen or a pencil, you're using a tool. You're aware that you're using a tool. Um, but you don't want your exoskeleton or your prosthetic or your robot to feel like a tool. You want to not have to think about how to use it. It wants to feel like part of you. And that's um, a really uh, important uh, aspect in people who would be using the device uh, long term. And uh, part of that is also perception, and uh, not perception, um, tactile feedback. So it seems that uh, there is something. Uh, when you use a robotic hand, you might not get that feeling. Sorry, did my internet cut out from my back? Yeah, okay. Um, and then the final thing is perception. So how does the user feel society will view them if they use the robot? And how will the user's perception of themselves change if they use the robot? And when we talk about perception, what we as engineers design might not be what the users actually want for a variety of reasons. And the example I have for that is uh, this tentacle arm. So this is a tentacle prosthetic. It's a really simple controller. Um, it's inspired by uh, non-human organisms and uh, it can contract and make these shapes. So it can be used to hold objects, grasp objects. And the person who designed it said that looking at people who use prosthetic arms, the person tends to use their prosthetic arm as like a holder or a gripper and does the more complex actions with their other hands. So you don't need a hand-shaped prosthetic to hold objects. So this design is simple, easy, and it works. But nobody wants to use that. How many people would feel comfortable wearing this sort of arm? And actually, interestingly, one person is. So this person uh, has made a vine-inspired arm that is slightly different from uh, the one shown here with one degree of uh, flexion. This actually has multiple degrees of flexion. I think it's um, three degrees. Uh, so she can control it and move it any way that she wants. But I haven't seen it being used to actually effectively interact with, op uh, with uh, objects. So I just 
pulled up these pictures whilst we're here. Um, I think what we should do now is go into the uh, presentation from group three, if group three are ready. And then afterwards we'll have questions. And if there's still time, um, I'll open up the floor to questions about biomechanics in general and talk a little bit about swarm robotics, which I think is really, really interesting. Okay, so I will uh, stop sharing. I can find the button. Good. And um, group three, do you want to to take uh, to take control? Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, great. Um, just wait for the rest of my team. Hello, everyone. Today we're doing a presentation on biomechanics and robots, and we're group three. <laughs> Next slide, please. So uh, first, I'm going to give you a small overview of um, who are we and introduction to the team. We're going to give a def small definition about uh, what are biomechanics and robotics. Then we have classification, various kinds of uh, biomechanics in, in robotics. Then we have challenges, the difficulties that we might face while creating a biomedical robot. Uh, we have applications where we, uh, how can we use the biomechanics into our lives? We have future works, how we can, uh, it's how we can like increase, uh, how we can um, do the future work in biomechanics, improve our biomechanics, and then a summary and a conclusion. So this is our team, I'm Mahdi Zaman, and the rest of our team is Abraham, Angel, and Akida and Ibrahim. So first we have, what is biomechanics? So in the term biomechanics, we have two terms. If you notice that we have the prefix bio, which means life. And then we have the field, we have mechanics uh, with the field of mechanics, uh, which is the study of actions of force. And biomechanics is the study of mechanical aspects of living organisms. Okay, so now we'll talk about the classifications. How can we classify different forms of biomechanics in robotics? Um, so I think there are two major classifications we could divide into um, wearable technology and then bio-inspired robots. Wearable technology, as you can see from the GIF over here, is technology that you wear. Um, as opposed to bio-inspired robots, that is um, a focus of biomechanics where we try to mimic um, the movements of various organisms and uh, make it into its own uh, you know, self-standing robot like this uh, cheetah over here. Um, I have this chart of different classifications we can do when going into wearable biomechanical robots. So um, the first level of classification is what body part is it focused on? Is it a full body robot? Is it just go on one section of the body or does it go on a specific joint? Next thing we can look at is the structure. Is it made out of a hard, rigid material? Is it bulky? Or is it made out of soft material? Is it more flexible? Is it easier to wear? Um, the next thing that we can look at is the action. Is it something that actively helps do, um, do various actions and perform? Or is it just something that supports um, passively? Does it just support weight? Um, the next thing we can look at is how is it powered? Is it powered through electricity or hydraulics or pneumatics, which is through like um, gas pressure, right? Uh, or air pressure? Um, is it a mixture of other things? Um, the next thing we can look at is the purpose. Is the purpose to recover from injury or is it to in performance or even enable performance for those who can't? And finally, we can divide it even further into where we apply um, the wearable. 
and we'll talk about that later in our um, application section. Um, we can divide wearable technology into three um, three different classifications. One is prosthetic, the other is an exoskeleton, and the third is an exosuit. So a prosthetic is something that's worn in place of a limb um, or, or body part. It could be either inside or outside the body. For example, a prosthetic heart would be worn inside the body while a prosthetic leg would be worn outside the body. Exoskeleton would be a hard, rigid um, skeleton that's worn on the outside of the body. An exosuit is similar to an exoskeleton, except an exosuit is made out of soft, soft material, which um, makes it easier to wear and easier to carry around. Um, just to go into these a little further. So as you can see, this prosthetic is worn in place of a hand. It um, focuses on individual limb. It's worn by amputees or those who are um, missing a limb. And um, in case of a robotic prosthetic, it would utilize sensors to enhance um, the adaptability and the locomotion of the limb. Then we have an exosuit. Uh, oh, did I skip one? No. Then we have an exosuit, which is uh, soft and portable. It's worn on the outside of the body. And again, this is worn to enable, enhance, or correct locomotion. Um, usually exosuits um, can be defined either as being on a section of the body or on the whole body. In this case, it's worn just on the legs. Finally, we have the exoskeleton, which is similar to an exosuit, except this is clearly more uh, rigid and bulky. So, so it's much harder to carry around, as you can see from the image over here. Um, again, it could be worn on the full body or on individual limbs or specific sections, depending on how you define it. It's hard, rigid, and bulky, which makes it less portable. Um, and again, it's used to enhance, um, enable, or correct movement. So next is the goals and challenges uh, within uh, biomechanics. And um, so uh, the robotic exoskeletons, they've um, trying to aid or improve human activities or rehab. And the main goal is to build a portable soft robot that's light and able to reduce the net energy of cost of not just walking, but any um, uh, like uh, action and to be able to assist with like people that have uh, um, part like partial issues is, or difficulties. And uh, um, the issue with that is because an exoskeleton uh, has to be able to help the patient without increasing the energy it would normally take to do that certain action. And other uh, devices um, or systems were only able to achieve this for stationary activities, not for moving uh, or walking or any, anything that requires any movement. And uh, also, um, there's many other factors that could lead to like an increase in a person's metabolic rate while using a wearable robot. For example, the weight. So um, the weight would have to be, uh, it would have to be like portioned properly. So properly work, working device would need the beneficial parts while minimizing the counterproductive effects such as the weight. So if, because if it was too much, it could alter um, like their normal movement and biomechanics and it would increase uh, the expenditure of energy rather than decrease it. So it would end up being counterproductive and the distribution of mass uh, in, um, would, would really increase the metabolic cost uh, significantly. And also when walking, people use uh, small amounts of energy at specific times in their gait as well. Uh, and when applying uh, forces at the wrong time, it could, that could also lead to an increase of uh, metabolic uh, expenditure. Now we're going to talk about applications. Next slide, please. So first we have applications in daily life because a lot of people could use biomechanics in their daily life. For example, individuals who have been missing an arm or leg, they could use prosthetics to replace it. So that would help them to perform their daily activities such as walking, dressing, or eating without any, any additional assistance from someone else. 
Uh, then we can also use it for medical applications. For example, paralyzed individuals, we can use it by assisting them to walk when they're previously unable to. We can also be uh, helpful to improve their walking speed, restore the kinematics. And you know, for someone who was involved in the accident, it could be really helpful. We also, we can also use it to improve our body. For example, a lot of healthy people, they could also use uh, biomechanics. Some exoskeletons, they could provide partial gait assistance, which can be used to improve strength and endurance of healthy individuals. Also, uh, it could be used in construction. Some exoskeleton can assist you to carry really heavy weights and uh, transferring to surface. So in construction, that would be really helpful. We, we can also use it in sports. A lot of people who are um, individuals who are, have something missing or like disabled people, they could use it, uh, use prosthetics such as the running blade, which we have in the right side. They could use it to run and, you know, that could really make a difference because they, they can be involved in the sports scene. Uh, they could run with other people and it's something that, you know, it's great for the future as well. So um, future work of biomechanics, specifically exosuits, um, the future work of biomechanics is speed, flexibility, and bulkiness. I say that speed plays a big role in biomechanics. Most biomechanics are for exosuits and making disabled humans able to walk, helping soldiers enhance their speed is also a big part. Um, exosuits are supposed to act like human limbs. The flexibility of most biomechanics are not flexible. So the future, future of biomechanics will be increasing their movement capabilities. The goal of exosuits and other biomechanics are supposed to fit underneath clothing, but most exosuits are mechanics are extremely bulky. So minimizing the bulkiness is future work. Um, speed, the speed of exosuits are really slow, helping with um, rehabilitating runners is important. The joint movements take a long time to move and the steps are too slow. Uh, their competition is based on exosuit speed and it should increase the speed of innovations and steps will be larger and the pile will be more stronger depending if you're walking or running. Bulkiness, um, supposed to fit underneath clothing, clothing, not supposed to weigh so much. Um, that's about it. And flexibility, mechanical legs should move diagonally and side to side. Ankle mobility should help with the balance and more flexibility would mean more balance with biomechanics. And that means less canes and less care when using these biomechanics. That's about it. Uh, so summary, what we should learn from this is biomechanics has a huge future ahead of it. Um, exosuit competitions will help increase the speed of exosuit innovations. And exosuits will help with rehabilitation and help people walk again or use other limb parts. So what lessons can we learn from this uh, presentation? So we've seen that there's a bright future ahead for biomechanics in technology and hopefully um, all of us who are aspiring to go into robotics can uh, use biomechanics to improve other people's lives. Thank you. And uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Great work, that was really interesting. Uh, I feel like we, we said a lot of the same things, which is good, right? That's a good sign. Um, one thing I will say really quick before we get into the questions for everyone in the room, uh, try and use person first language. So instead of uh, an amputee or disabled person, we use person with amputation and person with disability um, or other such uh, phrasings. It's um, it's just a, a nice way to kind of make sure everyone feels respected. But other than that, that was really good. Yeah. Any questions from anybody in the room? Uh, looks like no. <laughs> um, what was 
your what was the most interesting thing you each found when you were making this presentation like what made you think oh that's really interesting the competitions um they had the exosuit competitions i found that pretty cool it's really cool right yeah yeah no yeah. it was really cool seeing like from different countries too people all around trying to make it better absolutely anybody else from the team um i thought that the like extent of the applications for um like wearable technology was really impressive like uh the idea that people with disabilities or even people without disabilities could like take advantage of wearable technology in various fields um i think that like that overall was very interesting. Yeah, I 100% agree, which is why I do what I do. <laughs> um, I would say uh, you all spoke clearly. It was a really good presentation. Um, be careful with the definition of exosuit and exoskeleton. That's one of the things which is uh, relatively recent. Exosuit is uh, definitely a newer term. And it's in my mind, anything that's not rigid. So if it has rigid structures, like a, a metal bar or um, like a big solid actuator, that would be considered an exoskeleton. An exosuit usually uses bouting cables um, and soft textiles to do all the, uh, to do pretty much everything. And there's maybe a control and power unit located somewhere on the body uh, which pr helps provide that um, the actuation. Okay. Um, I think that is just about it. We didn't take a five minute break, so I don't see an issue with ending a little early. If anybody has any questions on biomechanics in general or robotics or anything like that, I'm here, I can answer questions to the absolute best of my ability. Um, so go ahead and ask. And uh, before everyone uh, ask any questions or leaves, uh, just say uh, note that we will be having another uh, one final lecture in two weeks. Uh, which is about the uh, evolutionary robotics. And, and the topic will be given by uh, another postdoc in our lab, uh, Tassio. Uh, so for this lecture, I will still need the student presentations. Um, maybe um, group one can do the presentation uh, for a second time. Is that okay, group one? Uh, one, are you there? Yeah. Um. What did you What did you say again? Would, next presentation. We ha we have to do the next presentation. Uh, yes. Uh. And uh, I will be uh sending out the uh, reading materials for uh this lecture uh this this evening or tomorrow morning. So okay. this will be the yeah, last lecture in two weeks, and uh, next week will be our uh, last a uh, last uh, lab session. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions to me or to Rai? Uh, yeah, for that lecture, uh, for the last lecture, it will be uh, evolutionary evolutionary robotics. Uh, and I will be sending out the uh, materials very shortly. Okay. Uh, whilst we're waiting for anybody to have any questions for like two minutes, um, 
I don't know if you've seen this before. These are, sorry, I know it's a, a YouTube video. But this is uh, another type of bio uh, robotic. And it's a soft robot. It's based on uh, sort of worms. And what's really interesting is they use these robots to cross bridges. So there's a gap. Um, and they use a swarm of these robots to close the gap and make a bridge and allow the other robots to crawl over the top of them. Um, and this is based off of uh, ants and other sort of insects that uh, swarm together uh, to work uh, or achieve their, their goals. So I, this isn't super biomechanics-y, but I thought it was uh, it's, it's pretty relevant. And if people are really interested in this field, uh, some conferences that would be a really good idea to look at would be um, the Adaptive Motion of Animals and Machines. There is a conference coming up, I uh, think later this year, and it talks all about how um, robots can be inspired from biological systems or biological systems um, can uh, be affected by robots. And it, it, it's an interesting uh, conference if you're interested in that sort of thing. Sorry, someone did ask a question. Uh, what kind of wearable robotics? Uh, so we have me exoskeleton in the lab, uh, in Dr. Sue's lab. There's also, um, I think, a hip exoskeleton and um, an, a back and an arm exoskeleton as well. Yes. A shoulder, shoulder it's exoskeleton. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've worked primarily with the knee exoskeletons and some hip exoskeletons previously. Uh, so the Lockheed Martin has a device called the Onyx, which is a knee exoskeleton designed uh, for soldiers. So I've worked with that exoskeleton a little bit. Um, and I've also worked with some ankle exoskeletons, uh, specifically uh, the Defy, which is an open source exoskeleton um, uh, used to kind of test different controls. It is pretty cool. I think it's exceptionally cool. Um, one thing I, one thing that might be of interest is, as the uh, group three mentioned, a lot of these exoskeletons um, don't really do multiple degrees of motion. So like it'll help you with flexion and extension, but that doesn't necessarily help your balance or your abduction or your adduction. All of your joints have a lot of range of motion and um, very few exoskeletons are designed to really help with the full motion. They're only really designed to help with one uh, joint and that's not how we move. And that's definitely something that uh, will be uh, a focus going forward and how we can actuate multiple joints. Uh, sorry, uh, one joint in multiple uh, directions. Well, I think we are about at time. So, Jinxi, if, if it's OK, everyone can get on with their lives. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you so much, Rai, for your lecture today. And uh, everyone you are, uh, are free to leave. And if you have more questions, we'll be here for about two, two, two more minutes. Mm -hmm. So. Have a good day, everyone. Yeah, I hope you found that interesting. And if you have questions at a later date, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff.
Okay, so if there's no more questions, uh, I will end this uh, Zoom meeting. Okay, see you, right? Bye. <laughs>